Hi, I'm Jared Gardner, and today we're going to look at a rare vascular neoplasm called anastomosing hemangioma. Uh, and this is a really nice example of, of one of these lesions. These were first described in the genitourinary tract, particularly the kidneys. And the reason that this um, rare tumor is important is because it has these kinds of vascular channels. These are anastomosing or interconnected vascular channels. Here's what we mean by anastomosing. If you look, these vascular channels, you could, can start on one. If you start here and take it like a maze, you can trace it through and follow into this channel and that connects to this one and that goes to that one. And then we go down here and over there and it keeps on going and going and going. This interconnected anastomosing pattern is a pattern that's uh, very typical of angiosarcoma. And so these lesions were first described as mimickers of the so-called well-differentiated form of angiosarcoma. That is, some angiosarcomas um, don't have a lot of nuclear atypia in, in occasional cases. And so this tumor, especially on a small biopsy, could uh, potentially mimic uh, angiosarcoma because of this anastomotic uh, growth pattern. So it's really important to know about this entity because it'd be easy to misdiagnose it. And um, I'll put some links to papers down below. It was first described, like I said, in the GU track by uh, Elizabeth Montgomery and Jonathan Epstein. And then uh, later, um, Ivy John and Andrew Fulp uh, published a very nice paper showing that it can also occur in um, somatic soft tissue and has a predilection for the paravertebral or paraspinal region. Okay, so here's the biggest thing I think that helps to differentiate this from angiosarcoma. The anastomotic pattern is here, but if you're lucky enough to get uh, the lesion entirely excised or to see the edge of it, you can tell that this is a very nicely circumscribed lesion. This lesion shelled out basically during surgery. It just kind of popped out because it's not infiltrating the adjacent tissue uh, to any significant degree. It's very circumscribed. You can see it as a sharp edge to the tumor where it's, it's separated from the adjacent adipose tissue uh, around it and left that behind in the patient and the tumor kind of popped out during surgery and uh, very little of it probably was left behind. There's a little cautery right there uh, where it was cut through, but basically uh, you can see a nice smooth border on the tumor and that is not the usual pattern of angiosarcoma. Angiosarcomas are usually very infiltrative into the tissue around them. And uh, I have a whole video about angiosarcoma and other vascular uh, neoplasms and I'll put a link for that in the video description down below if you need to acquaint yourself with uh, what angiosarcoma looks like microscopically. So let's talk more about anastomosing hemangioma. The most important thing is, like I said, the anastomosing channels uh, are there. And uh, despite that, the periphery of the lesion is circumscribed. So some other features that we'll see at higher power is that even though the channels are anastomotic, there's very minimal atypia. Uh, the cells might be mildly variable in size, but there's no severe nuclear atypia. There is minimal or no mitotic activity. Now you might be watching this and saying, I see some big dark cells there. That's a good point. What are those big dark cells? Let's go and take a look at them. See if I can get one in focus here. It's a little bit hard to get them to show up, but see the granules right there? This is a mast cell. And mast cells, sometimes the granules of mast cells are very pale, and sometimes they stain very darkly. Now, I'm not really sure why that is. I'm not sure if, if the mast cells actually are different in different situations, or if it's just the variation of the H&E stain between laboratories. But I've noticed that, that in certain settings, I see mast cells that are very dark with their granules, and other times the granules are very pale and very fine and delicate. The importance of knowing about the uh, mast cells with dark granules is that from low power, Power, the entire cell looks like one big nucleus. It looks so dark blue and only once you go close up can you see, oh wait a second, this is actually uh, just a mast cell that we're dealing with. So let's look here though at some of the, the uh, nuclei of the endothelial cells. So here's an occasional, that's actually an endothelial cell that's a bit larger, it's kind of cut at an angle. But So there may be some variation in size and shape, but in general most of the nuclei of the endothelial cells are quite small. The other thing that you often see is uh, this right here. This is called hobnailing. Hobnailing is when the, the endothelial cell bulges into the lumen of the vascular channel. And there is an entity called hobnail hemangioma or targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma. 
I have a video about that too. I'll put the link in the video description. And there are other entities, um, some hemangioendotheliomas and other vascular proliferations that can have hobnail cells. So hobnailing by itself is not specific. It even you can see hobnailing in angiosarc sometimes. So um, hobnailing is not specific. It can be seen in many different vascular lesions and it tends to be um, commonly seen in anastomosing hemangioma. Okay, and the other thing is that in angiosarcoma, sometimes we have what we call multi-layering, where endothelial cells are proliferating so quickly that their nuclei begin to stack on top of one another. You do not see that in anastomosing hemangioma. Multi-layering of endothelial cells is a worrisome feature that should always raise the possibility um, of angiosarcoma. And uh, you do not see multi-layering multi here. Here you can see that every channel is lined by just one thin layer of endothelial cells with small nuclei that kind of bulge into the lumen in some places. And as you can tell, most of these channels are small, basically capillary sized channels. There are a few channels that are a bit larger and maybe almost cavernous, but, but the majority of the vascular channels in these lesions tend to be capillary sized. See, again, in an area like this, if you just had a small biopsy, you might really get worried by this vascular pattern and be concerned about the possibility of an angiosarcoma. Okay, what other features? Well, I mentioned the mast cells. Scattered mast cells are a relatively common feature for some reason in anastomosing hemangioma. And in this case, they were particularly prominent. I'm trying to find the good area that had them again. Once you start recording the video, then you can never find the features that you want. Oh, here's another nice example. Let's see if that will show up. No, it's really hard to catch them on video because the granules are just so dark, in this case, that they blend right in. But they look kind of like a little fried egg. Let's see, maybe if I do the condenser, I can get it. Ah, oh, that looks better at, at, on the 60X. But you can see that there, is these, there are these blue granules in the cytoplasm. Here's the nucleus. And then the cytoplasm is very darkly stained because of the granules. And the scattered mast cells are a common feature. Uh, histiocytes can also be seen. And there are oftentimes areas of sclerosis and even sometimes necrosis, probably kind of a, related to a degenerative type of phenomenon or what, what we, that's what I kind of think that may be going on here. And others have suggested that there's kind of this degenerative sclerotic kind of change, like we can see in some other vascular lesions um, that kind of degenerate over time. And uh, so that's another finding is the sclerosis is a common feature. Uh, what else? Oh yes, up here. And this is particularly striking and is present in the majority of cases. Thrombi, fibrin thrombi filling up the lumens of vessels. And in this case, they were just numerous. The one other entity I always think of when I see luminal fibrin thrombi in a vascular proliferation is an angiolipoma. And angiolipomas sometimes can be quite cellular and be predominantly or almost entirely composed of a vascular component with very little adipocyte. So one thing you could think if you saw an area like this is you could think of an angiolipoma, a kind of cellular example of one. But again, the other features here, particularly the anastomosing channels, um, uh, don't fit for that entity at all. But uh, that's one other thing to think of when you see uh, luminal thrombi. But luminal thrombi are a very common feature here, and I think the other differential that that can kind of raise is a Masson tumor, uh, which is also known as intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia. And at some point, I'll probably do a video, a separate video on that, because I think it's an important entity to know about. It's basically a unique pattern of organizing thrombus, where you get a large thrombus in a vessel, and as the the thrombus reorganizes, it makes these papillary structures and can make some interconnected channels that look similar to the anastomosing channels. But here, this, this lesion is so extensively vascularized, so many uh, vascular lumens, and each distinct lumen is, has got the fibrin thrombi in it, that it wouldn't make sense for this to be um, a, um, a Masson tumor or papillary endothelial hyperplasia. So uh, one other area I wanted to point out was areas like this. These kind of areas can particularly look concerning because they look so cellular. And the, that's a feature that can happen in other vascular lesions too. When you have a lot of small capillary sized channels and they get compressed together and don't have um, expanded lumens, the lesion can look quite cellular and almost sheet-like. And sometimes that can be concerning and can make you worry again about angiosarcoma. But if you look closer here, you can see that this is not a solid sheet, but in fact, there are many, many little interconnected lumens in here. So the endothelial cells are all packed closely together and it gives the low power appearance of hypercellularity, but really they're still forming uh, these nice vascular channels. All right. 
Um, other things that you can see, uh, this case doesn't have it, but you can also see these hyaline globules within the cells that are similar to the little um, uh, pink bright pink or red um, globules that you can see in Kaposi sarcoma. So these, uh, these tumors um, sometimes have those, uh, but this particular example I'm showing you now doesn't really have that feature. And there is one other thing that's seen in a subset of cases. Let me find it. There it is. And I knew this was supposed to be here, so in this case, I looked around for a while until I could find it, because I always love when I get to see this. I don't see it very often. These small, very round, almost like perfectly round, dark dots, they look almost like, like lymphocytes at first glance, to me at least, but they're of variable size. There are tiny ones, medium-sized ones, and bigger ones, and they're all very, very dark and very nicely round. So these are uh, erythrocyte precursors, red cell precursors. So this is basically bone marrow elements, hematopoietic precursor cells. So this is extramedullary hematopoiesis, which is, is seen in a subset of anastomosing hemangiomas. Uh, and I always like when I see this because I don't see it often in skin or soft tissue, at least not in my practice. And uh, even though I find heme path very challenging, I think it's kind of cool to see these little precursors in places that they're not supposed to be. And again, in this field, note the nice mast cells. Look at those beautiful mast cells you can see right there. One, two, three. There's one here right on the edge of the field. There's another up there. So the mast cells are quite numerous and, and evenly scattered throughout this lesion. We also have these little foci of extramedullary hematopoiesis. I think there's another little area up here of oh, more mast cells too. So extramedullary hematopoiesis is another nice finding. So I think that's a nice thing is when you see this, this entity and you see the anastomosing channels but no atypia, you can certainly think about well diff angiosarcoma, but you need to keep anastomosing hemangioma in mind. And the ways that you can help uh, distinguish those is looking at the periphery of the lesion to make sure there's no infiltrative growth. And then finding some of these other features like the luminal thrombi, the scattered mast cells, the extramedullary hematopoiesis, the, um, the lack or, or very low mitotic rate or lack of mitosis even in, some, in many cases and areas of sclerosis, all the features we just talked about. So I think we have a really nice example of this uh, entity here. And uh, uh, recently, I think in 2017, uh, a, a molecular abnormality was reported in the majority of uh, tested cases of anastomosis hemangioma, and that's GNAC, G-N-A-Q. A GNAC mutation was uh, found in, um, in a majority of anastomosing hemangiomas. And that's really interesting because GNAC is seen in, in several other entities. It can be seen in uh, some congenital vascular lesions like congenital hemangiomas and the capillary malformations of Sturge-Weber syndrome. And also it's seen in non-vascular things like blue nevi and uveal melanomas. So it's kind of interesting to see um, how the same kinds of gene mutations can show up in very, very different tumors. And that always is a very intriguing thing to me in molecular pathology. Pathology, that, that we can have so many different um, uh, tumor types that end up having the same uh, molecular abnormality. So again, this is anastomosing hemangioma. I hope you found this video useful. And again, make sure you check out the video description below for links to papers in the literature and some other videos that might be useful to help further educate you about vascular lesions. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet and click like down below or leave any comments you might have for me. Thanks for watching.